The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. After the wise men had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. <clears throat> and Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. See everyone was able to make it out on the soggy morning. <clears throat> Sounds like the boring story this week. Um, I wanted to talk to you this morning. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I wanted to talk to you this morning about the psalm that we heard today, Psalm 84. Uh, to me, it's it's a beautiful psalm. It's it's one of the, uh, for me, one of the more poignant, touching psalms. But in order to understand the psalm, uh, you have to know that this is a, a psalm of pilgrimage. This would have, uh, we think, we don't know who the psalmist was, but we think that this was written by someone who was either on a pilgrimage or was writing it for pilgrims. And this was turned into, as, as most of the psalms were, they were generally sung as a form of worship. And it was uh, a song that pilgrims would have sung on their way to Jerusalem, okay? And a pilgrimage at that time, uh, just to get in the, in the context, the mindset of someone who was doing this, uh, a pilgrimage would have been expected for a practicing Jew. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, in Jerusalem, there was the temple. And as we see in Exodus, I think it's somewhere around chapter 21 or 22, uh, God tells Moses to build a tabernacle. And in that tabernacle is the Holy of Holies. And this is the place where God would reside here on earth. And so for, for the Jew, the temple was not simply a church or a place to go worship. But it was the physical presence of God in the world. And they had a duty to go and be in that presence. Now, depending on how far you were from Jerusalem, the, uh, the amount of times that you would make this pilgrimage would vary. Uh, there were many, many Jewish people uh, in Egypt and in other places. So this pilgrimage could be anything from days to weeks to a couple of months of traveling, of walking. And so you can imagine that if you were going to take even a, a few weeks, say it takes a couple weeks to get there, you're going to be there a week, a couple weeks to get back, this required tremendous planning, allocation of resources, whether it's money, energy, time. This was a big deal. <coughs> this was a very big deal. And so these pilgrims would come from all over to be in the presence of God. And this is what this psalmist is writing about. And it begins by saying, How dear to me is your dwelling, O Lord of hosts. That is the temple, the place where you reside. How dear is that? My soul has a desire and a longing for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh rejoice in the living God. The psalmist puts into words what I think must have been a terribly deep emotion. 
devotion. It says a longing, a desire and a longing for the courts of the Lord. To be in God's presence is this deep, deep desire. He goes on in 3 to say, Happy are they who dwell in your house, for they will be praising you forever. As those who get to work in the temple, who live there and take care of it. And those who go through the desolate valley will find it a place of springs, for early rains have covered it with pools of water. Now we see this desolate valley in other psalms, Psalm 23 and others. And it's literal and figurative. To get to Jerusalem from many places meant that you were going to have to go through some desert. And so, as a pilgrim, you would certainly hope that there was rain, that there would be pools of water on the way. But, as in most of the Psalms, this also speaks in a figurative term to our life, to those desolate places in life, where it says that God will provide pools of water. God will provide what we need to get us through these desolate valleys. It says they will climb from height to height and the God and the God of gods will reveal himself in Zion. By this point, Zion has become another name <clears throat> for the holy city, for Jerusalem. Behold our defender, O Lord, and look upon the face of your anointed, for one day in your courts is better than a thousand in my own room. And to stand at the threshold of the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. One day. One day in your presence, Lord, is better than a thousand at my house. It speaks of this deep, deep desire to be in God's holy presence. He says that he'd rather spend one day on the steps of the temple than a thousand days in the tents of the wicked, partying, carrying on, having a, a grand old time. He says this is more precious than a thousand of those days. He says no good thing will the Lord withhold from those who walk with integrity, those who walk with the Lord, who are right with God. But God will not withhold anything good. It says, O Lord of hosts, happy are they who put their trust in you. That's the summary of this psalm. Happy are they who put their trust in you. Now this psalmist puts into words this desire, as I said, to be in God's holy presence. Now we as Christians have a little bit different view on this. When Jesus was talking to the disciples about his imminent death, they began to be alarmed. They were worried, understandably so. But he says to them, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. For I am going to send you the great comfort, counselor, spirit of truth. It goes by many names. The Holy Spirit is what he's talking about. He says, even though I am not going to be physically with you and present as I am right now, I am going to send to you the presence of God to dwell within you. Holy Spirit. What this psalmist and thousands and thousands of others had to work so hard to get to, to be in the presence of God, Jesus has opened up to us anywhere and everywhere in the form of the Holy Spirit. To be in the presence of the living God. <clears throat> When the psalmist says, my soul has a desire and longing for the courts of the Lord. It's this deep desire to be in God's presence that these pilgrims showed time and time again. 
that is an example to each of us. To be in God's presence is a gift. And it's one that should not be taken lightly. And it's one that we shouldn't think we should receive just for showing up. It takes some work. It takes some commitment. It takes some trips through the desolate valleys. God didn't promise that all of that would go away. He doesn't say, simply believe in me, simply receive the Holy Spirit, everything will be perfect. He says, no, I will be there with you. That's what it's promised to us. I will be there with you. And anyone who's ever been through anything of importance in their life knows that the thing, whether it's a health scare, whether it's the loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, the threat of whatever, the thing is only a part of it. The thing in and of itself is bad enough, but if we had to go through it alone, that would be far worse. And to go through it with someone or others who love and care about us makes it meaningful, makes it powerful, makes it an opportunity to grow in love and understanding with one another. It doesn't mean that the cancer goes away. It doesn't mean that our loved ones are raised from the dead. It doesn't mean any of that. It means we're not alone. And that's no small thing. That's what God has promised to us. <clears throat> Be with us. The living God will be with you. But as the psalmist says, we have to long. We have to desire. We have to want it. With all our heart. We have to invite God in to receive that gift, to walk with the Lord. And if we do, it says, happy are they, happy are we who put our trust in the Lord, who put our faith in God, who walk hand in hand with the living God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we give you thanks for all your many blessings, and especially this day, for the gift of your Spirit. Pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to the knowledge of your love, to receiving that gift fully and completely. And help us to know that it doesn't mean that this world will all of a sudden be perfectly good. But rather, we will be in perfect union with you which is ultimately the most important thing. All this we ask in your Son's holy name. Amen.